Hello again. This presentation covers the principles of radioactivity. We've covered previously that isotopes are different versions of the same element that are going to differ in the number of neutrons found in the nucleus. Uh, now, let's consider the strong nuclear force. This is made possible by fundamental particles called gluons. This is what holds together the nucleus. Now, as you start building larger and larger nuclei, you start having more and more protons. And because they all have like charges, they are going to repel each other. So it's very important to consider the neutron-proton ratio in the nucleus. This is going to determine stability of an atom. For example, the stable ratio is 1 to 1 for protons to neutrons in smaller atoms. So, for example, carbon-12 is a stable isotope of carbon because it has a one-to-one -one ratio of protons and neutrons. It has six protons and six neutrons to give the total mass of 12. As we move into larger and larger atoms, we start to see the ratio increasing to 1.5 to 1. Uh, here what we need is a larger number of neutrons, which can help to mitigate the repulsive forces that exist between all of the protons that are now present in the nucleus of these atoms. Uh, we also know that unstable nuclei will decay over time by emitting particles, and they may also emit energy. Uh, so we can see on this display uh, that we find a one-to-one -one ratio of protons to neutrons shown by this line right here. Um, now, as we're looking at very small atoms, the one-to-one -one ratio is going to produce stable atoms. For example, carbon-12 has six protons and six neutrons. Um, when we move to a larger and larger nuclei, the stability line, uh, or for stable nuclei is actually going to deviate from that one-to-one -one ratio, uh, giving us greater numbers of neutrons, which are going to help to cancel out in some ways the repulsive forces of all the protons. Um, and then uh, on this, we can see also regions where we will find different types of radioactive decay, beta decay, alpha decay, and then either electron capture or uh, electron positive emission. The contents of this slide are also very applicable to the short video, The Island of Stability. There are three types of emission that GT chemistry students need to know. The first, which we'll discuss, is called alpha emission. Uh, this is where a helium particle with no electrons is going to be emitted. So an alpha particle is a helium with no electrons, so it would be positively charged. Uh, this type of emission can be shielded or blocked by paper. Beta emission, uh, what we find here is that a beta particle is going to be given off. Uh, now, as this occurs, a neutron will become converted to being a proton. Uh, because this type of particle is much smaller and it's much more energetic, it's going to take something more substantial to shield or block beta emission. So it would take something like wood in order to block beta emission particles. Uh, the third type of emission is called gamma emission. And this is giving off high energy photons. Uh, the mass number and the atomic number are going to stay the same, but because energy is being given off, it will produce a nucleus which is going to be slightly more stable than what uh, came before the emission occurred. This type of emission can be shielded by something uh, like lead. Let's take a closer look at alpha and beta decay. So here's an example of alpha decay. This would be the alpha decay of uranium-238. Uh, please note that the mass and atomic numbers are going to be equal before and after this decay process occurs. So before the process of decay, we've got uranium-238, atomic number 92, mass number 238. After the decay process occurs, we are producing an alpha particle, that's the helium again, and we're also going to produce a thorium-234 atom. Where does thorium come from? How are we getting that? We're subtracting 2 from 92. This is giving us the number of protons to give 90. and uh, We look up element 90 on the periodic table. That's thorium. The mass, 238 minus 4, gives the mass of 234. So we'd be producing here an isotope of thorium that has a mass of 234 atomic mass units. In beta decay, please note that the mass number stays the same throughout, 40, 40 and that the beta particle that's being given off has no mass. What happens is 
that a neutron will become converted into a proton. So we see that the atomic number will actually increase during the process of beta decay. Um, please note here that we would pro be producing an atom which has a one-to-one -one ratio of protons and neutrons. Uh, so because this is a small atom, we're producing a stable one-to-one -one ratio. Another example of beta decay is the decay of carbon-14. So here we have a carbon atom with six protons, and uh, here we have a carbon-14 atom, which we've built, because there are six protons plus eight neutrons. The mass number is 14. We can see that the net charge is zero. Now, during beta decay, a neutron will actually become converted to form a proton. So the only way that I can show this with this model is to take one of the neutrons and drag it away. Oops, I accidentally got a proton there. Let me get a neutron. I'm going to take that away and I'm going to add in a proton. And we can see that this is going to form a nitrogen atom. And now we're going to have a 7 to 7 ratio of protons and neutrons producing a stable isotope. Please note the nitrogen that's formed during the process of beta decay of carbon-14 would gain electrons so that it would not uh, stay in the ionized state for long. Here are some examples of nuclear equations. I'd like for you to try to balance these. Please pause, playback, and try to balance the following nuclear equations. Here are the solutions for those nuclear equations. Uh, let's take a closer look at each of them. So we can note in the first example, we have uh, radium 88 with a mass of 226. It's undergoing alpha decay, so we know for sure that it's going to produce this alpha particle, a helium. We're subtracting 4 from 226 to get 222. We're subtracting 2 from 88 to get 86. And then we're looking up on the periodic table to find element 86, which is radon. Another example of alpha decay is lead 204, which is going to decay to once again produce an alpha particle. I'm subtracting 4 from 204 to get 200 for the mass number, subtracting 2 from 80 to get element 80, and I look up element 80 on the periodic table and find out that it is mercury. Uh, in beta decay, we have to remember again that a neutron will become converted to form a proton. So the beta decay of copper 66, we'll see that the mass is going to stay the same, however that the atomic number will increase by one. So we'll go from copper to zinc, and this is that beta particle again. And here was that example we looked at with the atom builder. Uh, we're going from carbon-14 to nitrogen-14. Uh, and note again the ratio. Here the ratio would be six protons and eight neutrons. That's not a one-to-one -one ratio for a small atom, so that particular isotope of carbon is unstable. The atom produced by the beta decay process will have seven protons, the atomic number is seven, and would have seven neutrons to give that total mass of 14. So the seven-seven or one-to-one -one ratio is going to produce a stable isotope of nitrogen. So what's the difference between fission and fusion? Fission is a process which involves the splitting of a nucleus. This occurs, can occur, when nuclei are going to be bombarded by neutrons. So here we see a neutron being fired at a nucleus of uranium-235. This triggers greater instability within that nucleus, which is going to cause it to split apart. And this process is going to form many additional high-energy neutrons. These high-energy neutrons can collide with additional uranium atoms, which is going to cause a chain reaction. And this is what's occurring in a nuclear reactor or a nuclear bomb. The process of fusion involves the joining of nuclei, and this is going to occur at very, very high temperatures. And I couldn't resist a chance to uh, show a picture from one of my favorite movies, Back to the Future, featuring, of course, right here in the DeLorean, Mr. Fusion. So what are some uses of fission and fusion? We know that fission has been used to produce atomic bombs. It's also the type of reaction that's occurring that's utilized in nuclear power plants. So here we see a nuclear power plant which is uh, utilizing fission reactions to produce energy. Uh, the energy given off is going to heat water, uh, which is generating steam, which can be used to drive turbines, which are generating electricity. Fusion reactants 
uh, fusion reactions, sorry, are uh, the ones responsible for the solar fusion, which produces the chemical elements. Uh, reference back to the origins video that you saw. Uh, fusion was used to produce the hydrogen bomb. And perhaps someday in the future, we'll have nuclear reactors that use fusion instead of fission. Um, and this could be very desirable because it may uh, result in nuclear power, which doesn't produce as many radioactive wastes that are going to have long-lasting uh, negative effects. Let's do some additional uh, comparison of nuclear and chemical reactions. In chemical reactions, we know that mass is going to be conserved. There are some reactions which will absorb energy. We call these endothermic reactions. There are other reactions which will release energy. We refer to these as exothermic reactions. In nuclear reactions, there's actually a small amount of mass which is converted to energy, and this is related to us by Einstein's famous E equals mc squared. In nuclear reactions, there are absolutely huge amounts of energy that can be given off. Uh, for comparison's sake, let's think about the fission of one kilogram of uranium in uh, a nuclear bomb. This would release as much energy as an explosion of 20,000 tons of dynamite. So the amount of energy that's associated with nuclear reactions is absolutely unbelievable. The final learning objective that will be covered in this presentation is how to calculate the average atomic mass from isotopic data. So what we have here is data for the element sulfur. We can see that there are four different isotopes that we're being given information about. Note they all have the number 16. That's the atomic number telling us that sulfur has 16 protons. But the mass number is different for each of these, 32, 33, 34, and 36. These are actually rounded values from the mass of these different isotopes. So we can see the full values are being given here. There's actually some rounding here, but I, I decided to cut it off at three places after the decimal. Um, now, what's complicated about solving this type of problem is that these different isotopes are not found in the same percentages. If they were, we could just add them all up and divide by four, find the average, and call it good. But here's the problem. You see, this particular isotope, which makes up uh, you know, almost 95% of all the sulfur atoms that are, that are found. Uh, the other isotopes that we have, uh, this one, is making up less than 1% of all sulfurs everywhere. Uh, this particular isotope makes up uh, just under 5%. Um, and then this one is an extremely rare isotope of sulfur. So these all will contribute to the average, but they're not contributing equally to the average. So let's look at how we work with uh, this information about percent abundance and mass to calculate an average atomic mass. So here's the work that we would do in order to calculate the average atomic mass from this isotopic data for sulfur. Uh, so we would take the mass of the most uh, common isotope, 31.978, and multiply it by the decimal form of the percent abundance. So I'm dividing 94.93 by 100 to get 0.9493. I find this value. Uh, now, I know that my percent abundance has four sig figs, so I'm going to underline my final significant digit in this value. My next isotope has a percent abundance of 0.76, so I'm going to divide that by 100 to get this value. I'll multiply that by the mass to calculate this number right here. Again, two sig figs from my percent abundance, so I'm underlining my final significant digit. And then I have my third isotope, point, uh, 4.29 divided by 100 here, multiplying by 33.968 to get 1.4572272, underlining the third digit, which is the, um, the final significant digit. And then my final isotope, again, dividing my percent abundance by 100 to find the decimal version, multiplying by the mass to get this value. Again, I'm underlining the final um, significant digit. As I add these up, I will keep the last full column. Uh, so the final column that I can keep as a significant digit would be in the hundredths place. So I calculate an average atomic mass for sulfur of 32.06 atomic mass units. Please reference back to the calculating averages assignment to um, consider why we don't need to, after summing this, why we don't have to divide by four. We've already factored in the abundance of each particular um, isotope type here. So again, there's no need to divide this answer by four. Uh, we've already factored in the abundance of each of the different isotopes that's contributing to the average mass of sulfur.